Okay, welcome everyone. I'm looking forward to presenting to you an update uh, to our views um, in markets. They're certainly uh, in need of a cosmic assist, I think. So we're going to basically go through our presentation. Should be about a half hour to take any questions and answers you may have. So let's start with our slideshow. Format will be, we'll discard with the big picture, since we like to be top down, obviously. Then we'll give some of our views for the next four months in both the stock and the commodity markets. We have two sponsored presentations. They're short, four or five minutes, but I think they're worth listening to and either uh, purchasing some of these stocks or at least following them. And then our final thoughts, a few really aggressive speculations, and then a trading play for the week. Okay. And I want, of course, thank two of our sponsors, Max Silver and Gold Terra, uh, for being sponsors. Again, this is primarily an update of our 2024 views in the market in terms of what's happened and what can be happening. Disclaimer, of course, uh, is required, uh, which simply says that if it doesn't happen the way I said it happens, then the market's wrong. Or wait, maybe it's a little different. Uh, maybe. Anyway, you, know, you understand what disclaimers are. You have to do your own due diligence. If you're not a sophisticated investor, then obviously before you put money on the table, get some professional advice. We will be recording this and posting it on YouTube, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps later today. It takes a day or two so that it's unnecessary for you to take notes and also if you wish to review it, as well as inviting any colleagues and friends to attend. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. Uh, we'll try to answer them as, at the end, uh, but don't use the chat box for anything else, please. Thank you. This is something I want you to look at because this is the most important slide we have. I'll let you read it, and then I'm going to discuss it. But these are the key things that we see that are coming up. So we'll give you a moment to do and then I will talk what's going on here. Okay, the first is, of course, and the most important is in our viewpoint, there is a global slowdown and recession coming in 2025. Whether uh, it will be acknowledged in currently, 50% uh, of the people, more than them, believe we're in a recession now. The government says that's not true, and of course the government wouldn't say it if it wasn't true, right? Leaving that aside, it will be recognized uh, globally next year. So the question is how to prepare for it, how to make money beforehand, and uh, what risk strategies should be incorporated. But again, number one, there's a global slowdown recession coming next year. No ifs, ands, or buts. That means 90% chance. One of the things we can do, of course, is gold, entertainment, and cash. And these are things we like. Uh, they did very well in the depression. We're not expecting a depression. And we will give a lot of detailed strategies and stock and sector picks uh, in December. Maybe we'll have an update after the election. Uh, but those are things that work always pretty well. It's a little early for the entertainment, not too early for gold and cash. I don't think it's ever too early in this time. Interest rates are the big thing. Many people in the beginning of the year thought it would be six. We said it would be two or three. Our first was May or June. And interestingly enough, while the U.S. did not lower interest rates, the rest of the world did. And the markets acted, the U.S. markets, as if they had. So the next time is, of course, September, which is fairly likely, uh, but that may or may not be the case, and, of course, December. So those are the three times that the money is betting on. Um, the next big thing we had, and we'll review this later, is the markets will be down in August and December. And, of course, we did see the beginning of August. By the way, it's quite possible we're going to have that uh, a replay this week. Obviously, with the um, 
Democratic National Convention, everything's being done to avoid that, but they're still under some risk. And we, we're playing that risk at the moment, although a bit early. And of course, December. December could be as early as November, post um, election US, but there'll certainly be people preparing uh, for 2025. So there are two red times, one of which we may have had. I think there's more to come in this month. Maybe not. We're trading accordingly and December. The big risk and unknown, of course, is the October 22nd to 24th, just before the election, the Russian BRICS summit, whether they announce uh, a gold-backed currency, whether they take some more anti-dollar uh, elements, but that's a big risk to markets. And, of course, the U.S. election coming which is a very important thing. Now, one of the things we're doing, unlike most people, is recommending a gold pair trade, uh, which with gold over 2,500, which is to sell gold and to uh, partially, not fully, of course, and to buy gold stocks when silver gets a little higher, or you could do it now, to buy uh, gold, silver stocks but sell silver, sort of as a pair trade hedge. We'll get into that in some detail. Uh, remember, however, when gold is up, gold stocks tend to outperform. Likewise, when gold is down, gold stocks tend to underperform. Same thing with silver. So this is the big picture we'll be talking about in some detail. Again, a recession is coming. There are a number of ways to play it. The markets can be still down this month, uh, although we may have seen it. December coming. The big issue is going to be the end of October, November, and then pair trade. So let's get into some details here. Um, and these are the four big known unknowns. One is the Fed. And of course, they'll be talking about this on Friday. The market is anticipating a talk of 25 bips, 50 bips, I think is highly unlikely, at least in September. Ukraine and Israeli wars, which can spin out of control and affect markets strongly. The BRIC dollar alternatives, which are just beginning to be factored into the markets. And of course, the US presidential election. Knowing the answers to these four things uh, will give you some heads up in the market. So this is the fantasy land. A soft landing for the U.S. and global economy by in 2025. It's being sold now. Um, I think J.P. Morgan just came out with today saying that they feel that the odds of a U.S. recession are very small. I would just say that they're uh, early, or at least to be acknowledged early. And of course, the. Consumers, especially in the United States, are just beginning to feel it. Banks are just beginning to react. We'll be more so next year because everything's being done to make everything look good and nice um, before the election. But this is how most people feel their pocketbooks. So is there going to be no recession? Is there no recession now? Is there no inflation? I don't know. I keep getting... Uh, my cleaner just raised my bill this week 10%. Eggs just went up again this week. Uh, postage stamps went up 8.8% last month, but the government only sees 2 or 3%. Well, as long as you believe it, markets will be comfortable. I don't quite believe it. High recession odds, certainly next year. Currently, depending, it's probably here, but won't be acknowledged, which means in the markets it won't be shown. Two things, what's the reality and how is the market interpreted? So we think as time goes on, they'll price in more of an economic slowdown, which actually is good for the bonds in some cases. But economists and markets are still predicting a soft landing ahead, as we think it's a fantasy. So we've been trading stagflation light, and the only difference is I think we're going to see more recession and less inflation. There's certainly inflation, but it's not as high as before because of more recession. These are our fundamental views. Again, fundamentals are not the only factor in the marketplace, but it tells you what we're doing and why we're doing things. Now, this was one of the few years that we didn't sell in May and go away. Traditionally, we always did so. 
But to do so this year would be fighting the Fed in the cosmos. So if we look at where the markets were in May, and you see where they went to in terms of August, whoop, you'll see this was not a time to sell in May and go away. It was in August, as we suggested. Markets came back. We still think it's a time to come back. But again, both the cosmos, and, and that was due to the uh, April, the Jupiter Uranus and the uh, eclipse stuff. But basically, it was fighting the Fed. It was not a year to go, as we almost always do, sell in May and go away. But we think it's not a bad idea to raise cash. So what are the March risks? Obviously, real estate capitulation, if you have a $100 million building, building, building selling for $10 million. If you were trying to sell an apartment at $550,000, now you're asking $500,000. You're seeing the starts of it. Nothing serious because everyone's anticipating lower interest rates, which is good for the real estate market, certainly sectors of it. But that hasn't happened. There are declining earnings. Money flows are declining. We do have, if you don't believe in recession, we have slowing growth, and bank tightening credit is just beginning. There'll be more as time goes on. Plus, I believe inflation is somewhat sticky. I see it in a number of places. I know we can substitute cheaper goods and services, but things that I like to buy are going up. Some exceptions, of course. De-dollarization is clearly serious, and then the usual regulatory, and of course, depending on what the election is in outcome in November, the regulatory uh, issues will be much greater than if there are other outcomes, geopolitical complexities, and the usual geopolitical and swan events. So there's lots of market risk, but there's always lots of market risk. It's just when the market wants to look at it. There are opportunities. One was gold. We did very, very nicely with that, and we're still very happy. I'm a Leo, so I love gold. Stress, distress, M&A, whenever we go to any M&A events and distressed events, it's feelings of caviar and champagne. They're happy. They're going to be happier this year, and they're going to be happier next year. The U.S. presidential election gives you winners and losers. Oil being one of them, or classical energy, and many others. Uh, hard asset inflation protection, a little bit less important, but dividends are good. You're never wrong with profitable companies with pricing power, that is to say conservative, value-based, if you're worried about what I'm worried about. And, of course, special situations. And while this is a stock picker's market, we have to say that index investing to date has performed extremely well. Whether it will do for the whole year, certainly by December, I don't think so. But at the moment certainly doing well. So what is our approach to the market? First, we're cautious. And you can say, why be cautious? Because the markets are flying high. But we think there are reasons to be cautious. If in the beginning of the month of August you weren't able to buy when the markets panicked, then you should definitely raise some cash now because you're going to need to have another opportunity, perhaps before the end of August, but almost definitely uh, post-November election and within 30 days or so of uh, December. So always have the ability to buy. And if you can pick stocks, not necessarily, you may want to pick sectors. There are winners and losers, and you can see things that have dropped dramatically and certainly stocks that have flown so where the stock is flying or flying the coop. If you can do the stock picking, fine. If not, index or sector investing. But be cautious is my advice, as always. So you know what they say about fundamentals? They don't matter until they do. So we'll talk about a little bit about copper. Since we believe we're in a session, you know, we were selling it earlier when it was much higher, and now we are sort of in a range that's correct, I think, longer term, which means 2026, later in 2025, I think copper will do very well if you're a long-term investor and buying and accumulating. Silver is roughly trading at value. 
Oil is a very interesting situation because it should be higher, but there are three things going against oil and one thing for it. What's going against oil is the astro, which is somewhat negative. The seasonal factors, what is to say that the August driving will be over in the Northern Hemisphere, so that's negative, and the U.S. election, because for some reason, the party in power never wants to have oil too high because people sometimes vote with their pocketbook. So there are three things against it. The only thing positive, unfortunately, is the very sad situation in the Middle East, which could blow up at any moment. We certainly don't want to do that, so we're not going to um, short oil because there's that high risk with it. But it's undervalued, but there are a lot of negative forces. So you can trade it very short term. Bonds currently also are um, somewhat fairly valued. I think the S&P and NASDAQ are so ridiculously overvalued, but again, doesn't matter. And gold is too, but we're going to talk about that separately. So that's the fundamental picture uh, in the commodity space. Uh, what we like to do in general, if we're trading in commodities, is we buy from second support and third support. Gold support for the moment is 2280 and 2500. Obviously, we're playing at uh, 2500. Silver is 24 and 26. We did a number of buys there. Copper was very interesting because we were looking at 340 to 360. We got to 360, we did, but then we got greedy. We should have done half at 360, half at 340. We didn't, didn't do it. Recommended le leaving it at 450. Now uh, we would try to buy it at 380 again. That implies a different scenario. That is to say a recession. But later on in the recession, it will do very well. Oil, we did a lot of great trades. Now we're not trading it because on the one hand, we want to be short for a number of factors. On the other hand, the risk is extremely high. So it has to be very well hedged if you do that. Uh, and it is uh, undervalued. Bonds, we're not trading at the moment uh, unless they go to extreme levels. Gold and silver on weakness, we're always buying. Okay? As either a very short-term trade or a long-term trade. Technical analysis, we can see the 50-day and 100-day, which is roughly the 5,500 level, the 5,000. If you're long uh, and you're a technical trader, there's a lot of reasons to stay long. Uh, and however, we would add some protection. So at the moment, we get under there. Uh, markets are fairly uh, comfortable. Uh, that can change on a dime, as we saw in December. Actually, as we saw in August, we may see again, and we will certainly see again later this year. The astrology picture, uh, we've discussed it before, but the interesting things, the U.S. Pluto return, that is to say the Civil War we're practically in, uh, will be somewhat resolved by the second half of 2026. And until then, it can go either way, but that's going to continue for a while. Um, we'll notice that things are being shaken up. Uh, those of you that are looking at September 1st, we um, come back in. So uh, things will be changing and again. The total eclipse, of course, was the reason, the, one of the main astrology reasons why the market was up so much and why we didn't sell in May. But if we look at the Saturn-Neptune, that was, for example, when the Berlin Wall uh, came down. Uh, that's when BRIEX collapsed, and that's the U.S. markets uh, in next year, and we think the recession's coming in. So you've got time if that's what you're worried about. With the Jupiter-Saturn, which is within 30 days, the August 19th, one of the reasons we're doing it today, there's some risk coming in as of 226, or we're in earlier, and December 4th, but it's really 30 days before that. So we're really talking, uh, the, the August thing came in a day or two early, as to say Goldman Sachs jumped it a bit, so any time from November 4th on. So this is the big picture. We've talked about it before. Uh, we obviously like the precious metals, and we think it's good to be, and if you don't have, we have a full allocation of gold and silver, uh, but 
If you don't, we think it's a good idea to look at some stocks that you don't own. It's so totally true that only gold is as good as gold. And I quote someone that we're in an environment of significantly elevated geopolitical tensions, which always benefits gold. And unfortunately, I think that's going to stay for a while. Uh, plus, of course, seasonally, we're in a positive time to, through February. So if you don't have gold, and most of you probably do, I, or silver, I would consider it. This is a slide from our last time, and we said basically that by June of 2024, which we've had, that gold would become favorite. It's, we're here. <laughs> we've got above 2,000. We're now at 2,500, maybe 3,000, primarily due to positive astro, gold floor being established. Now the question is whether 2,500 is a floor. We're not so sure, but it can be. And the geopolitical crises just keep on going. So it's a favorite sector now. That's going to be a slide we don't need to show anymore in the future. So what is our goal view? And we're going to give it. We are long personally and recommend being long precious metals as an investment and a portfolio hedge. It has two functions. And one buys and sells accordingly uh, and not the same way. Classically, it was a 5% allocation that went to gold. I think that could be considered light, but it depends on what else you own. If I were a, advising any gold companies or silver companies, I would recommend at least a 20% hedge and or some collar, perhaps a little bit more if it's a collar. Uh, but definitely, at least it's a time to be hedging your portfolio in gold and silver, even though we're bullish. If you're pair trading, I would recommend 50% of it be pair traded. That is to say, buy gold, sell gold, buy gold stocks, sell silver, buy silver stocks, but there are exceptions. If the gold is due to a weak U.S. dollar, also doing smaller micro caps will greatly outperform. While if gold is due to crises, then gold will outperform and perhaps large gold cap stocks because everyone will be very nervous. So again, it depends on your views, uh, how to handle this, but we do recommend that hedge for some people. What is gold worth? Is there an upper limit? No. Conservative investors, we think 2,500 gold where we are, $30 silver is comfortable, even though it's a little bit overpriced. If you're aggressive, then you think it should be $30 and 50, although silver has a lot of uh, resistance at 34 and 38. Here's an example. If we look at the chart um, here, you'll notice that when gold was down, the GDXJ, by the way, is the, uh, the smaller cap ones. The GDX are the larger, but it's the same type of thing. When gold was down, clearly um, gold dropped more. Whereas when gold was up, you can see 30 versus 40%. So the more gold is up, the more the stocks will outperform. That's classic. But if gold's going down, they'll drop more. This is just if you want to tune your portfolio to outperformance, which we like to do. But if you own it, there's nothing wrong with it. You may, want, may not want to do all this work. These are for active managed portfolios. Our favorite silver play, which you'll notice the same thing. If we look when silver was down, that basically um, mag dropped, and we were doing a lot of buying there, whereas currently it's up. We believe it's going to be up further because, hey, it's a good company. So again, if you want to play gold and silver versus the stocks. Now, in the old days, say 2008, so many of these companies were badly run. Uh, the mid caps and the large caps companies were just very poorly run. That's not the case today. There's much better management. There's much better uh, running of the companies, although I don't think enough of them do enough hedging personally. But basically, they're not chasing gold at any price. So it's a different ball game if you got burned before. So I'm going to repeat the summaries that you've heard many times before. Gold is very cheap, geopolitical crises. 
Globally, if you're an investor who cannot or will not buy the U.S. dollar, say you're a brick, uh, or you want to safely hedge the U.S. dollar exposure, only gold is as good as gold. Something like Bitcoin does not work the same way. It's an attractive risk mitigation, and basically metal stocks can well outperform physical gold and silver, but they have to be watched, and they have to have stocks. And if there's a real stable coin, then gold will be at least three to 5,000. Central banks are buying heavily, record levels, BRIC countries are selling U.S. bonds or letting them expire and buying gold, whether they'll come out with their own currency, I have some question about it, but certainly they're adding to their gold exposure. And if there is an international gold-backed currency, it easily gold could easily be 4,000. And of course, U.S. retail interest is much greater. It's obviously great in many parts of the world, but the U.S. investor is just beginning to get involved, and there's a lot of money there. This is something people may argue with. Uh, it's a lagging indicator. The fair value of gold. Gold is way overvalued, in my opinion. However, just as for many years gold was way undervalued, gold can stay overvalued for many years. So even though I think it's only worth 2150, uh, it can stay at 3,000, 4,000. This is a fundamental view. As a commodity, it's currently worth about 1840. As a currency, 2200. But if the bricks come in, that could double to 4,000. Inflation is mixed here. I think it's higher. We may get, we're probably in a range of 1950 to 2050. And we have to see what the next couple of results are. I think it's a lot stickier, but it's going to be very. Uh, I won't say manipulated, uh, but very, I don't know, doctor is the wrong word, uh, highly questionable statistics on inflation coming till at least November. And as a crisis, 2580, but depending on the crises, it could be 3,000 or more, but I think the crises we have is what, why the market's primarily trading the way it is. It's between the currency and the crisis, but it's mostly the crises today. Uh, so we, we're long both as an investment, as a hedge. Silver is worth, in my opinion, 27.50. So it's basically a little overvalued, uh, but it has a, some weaker support at 30, but 34 and 38 are very strong resistance where we will definitely be selling and buying some silver stocks or more silver stocks, even if it goes to 50. Last time we were shorting it at 49 and change. So we're going to give a few trip. Uh, we're going to give a few mining picks. The important point is that even if gold and silver drop 15 to 20 percent, even 20 percent, the quality companies are sporting deep value, i.e., they're undervalued. Seriously, just needs a different market. So there's a lot of potential in the gold and silver stocks. It has the run hasn't started. We're in a positive time till February. So if you don't own some, get some. On our website, our luncheons, webinars, we tend to give a few. And of course, when you buy, it's always a question of the right price and time. So uh, we'll give a few. You've seen them before. These are some to look at. I'm sure you have others. Uh, but I would definitely have some if you don't. Uh, and, but before we do, I want to give two uh, of my silver, of our sponsors, Mag Silver and Gold Terror, they're very different companies. One is billion dollars, one is a micro cap to give some examples of extreme. And then we'll give you about eight or nine picks. Then we're going to go through some trading uh, and some review and questions and answers. So let me go into um, Max Silver. Oh, wait. Oh. Before I do, I want to point out that this was our desert island pick. And our desert island pick was 2023. We've been on that desert island now for almost a year and nine months. And what it said was, if I had to have one stock that I didn't even, I, could, I had no internet access and I was going to come out, I, I was going to be picked up in January 2025, what stock would it be? It turned out to be Max Silver. And because it went down, even though, in my view, under 13, it was a steal, 
because we have targets of close to double that. We got a lot of buying in there earlier. If you don't own some, I think you should consider it. So let's just hear a short presentation on it and then another short presentation that we have a lot more material to cover. So let's, whoop, one second. Hello everybody, welcome to the MAG Silver presentation. Thank you for your time. We'll be making some forward looking statements today and uh, as a lot of you know, MAG has had a history since 2003 of turning those forward looking statements into facts. We're a high grade tier one silver producer. We're well positioned for continued shareholder value creation. Our focus is advancing high grade district scale precious metal projects in the Americas the machine is the, well, the current machine is the one of Scipio mine in Mexico. It's a 44% interest we own, 56%. The remaining is owned by Fresneo and they're the operator. That machine funds the cash that we need to explore the deer trail project in Utah, the Lada project in Ontario, and of course exploration on the uh, one of Scipio property. $97 million in cash, and uh, no debt and a $40 million revolver. A commitment to sustainability is reflected in our progressive improvement in third party um, rating scores since uh, 2018. So here's the company. You see on the left the one, the Scipio project. It is a standout asset. Uh, high production rates, extremely good margins, $4.49 all in sustaining cash costs for Q2 and a generational mine life. And as I said, that cash flowing machine funds exploration on that property, any capital expenditure on that property and the exploration requirements for deer, deer trail in Utah where we own 100%, polymetallic, silver, gold, lead, zinc and copper and the Lada project which is gold driven in Ontario. So looking quickly at um, one of CPO and what you're going to see, we only have three assets and they, they all tick the location, location box. Here is the joint venture ground in red nestled amongst the Fresneo tenements in uh, the state of Zacatecas in Mexico, sitting on the Fresneo trend, which is the world's preeminent silver district. And you can see here our rapid progression to cash flow. We commenced milling, commissioning the plant in uh, early 2023 commercial production in mid 23 we hit the 4,000 ton per day nameplate in q3 and we started to generate significant cash now it's a wonderful asset high grade high margin long life but it is still very much an exploration asset only five percent of that joint venture grounds explored and we have compelling geological targets to follow up on the property in the non-explored area. So watch Juanacipio for more exploration success. In Utah, again, I'm going to give you a location, location slides sitting on the main fault between the Great Basin and the Colorado Plateau of the Western United States, hosts to elephants like Park City, Bingham, Tintic, and now the relatively unexplored deer trail, which we've commenced exploring now. Looking for these red, high grade silver mantos that come off this pink porphyry in the middle. We know the porphyry's there. We're not as interested in that as we are in the high grade silver mantos. Up in Ontario, again, we sit on the Cadillac Lava Break, one of the most prolific gold producing areas in the world. And we sit on the uh, Cadillac Lava Break, the first order structure. We have second and third order structures. There's a host of historical mines, current mines, and mines to be built and in our case, mines to be discovered. So why buy MAG? We're high margin, long life. We now have a de-risk underground silver producing asset that generates free cash flow 
that comfortably funds exploration and gives us the opportunity in the future to uh, allocate excess capital. Our three projects remain exploration assets by virtue that one of Scipio is only 5% explored. So there's organic growth in the company. And again, we have a very strong balance sheet, $97 million in cash, no debt, and a $40 million revolver if you wish it. So thanks for watching. www.magsilver.com for more information. In particular, if you want to drill down on future mine plans, the technical aspects, watch the technical report presentation from March 2023. It gives you great insight into this wonderful asset. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your summer. Bye. Okay, it's going to uh, last one second, just a quick look at the market. Okay, one second. Okay. Now we're going to give you uh, one of our favorite micro caps. It's a nickel. We're going to discuss micro cap investing in a little bit here. Uh, there's a number of reasons. This is a gentleman who's done it before, uh, has the resources to do it, the skill set, and also put his money where his mouth is. He's, he's a major investor in the company and bought at the market level. So all the right sort of things, good location, blah, blah, blah. We'll let him talk about it. But if you want a little baby trade to try it and looking for a home run or a grand slam, this is a company you might want to consider. So one moment, please. Okay. Whoop, sorry. Whoop. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Gérald Panetton, Chairman Executive of uh, and CEO of Goterra Resources, a junior company exploring in uh, northern Canada, most likely in the Northwest Territory uh, in the town of Yellowknife. Uh, the decision to, to decide to uh, explore in the area uh, was very well supported by many different important things that I value through my career as a geologist in corporate development, valuation of projects start with infrastructures. And one of the biggest, biggest things that uh, Yellow Life offers is infrastructure. But not only that, I think you're looking at the big, large target. The Campbell Shear, which already produced 14 million ounces over a strike length of about three to five miles, is long, longer than this, further south, further north of the Giant and the Con Mine which stopped operating in 2003 when gold price was depressed around $325 an ounce. Uh, the Campbell Shear is still there. Uh, it's open to the north, it's open to the south and of the Con and the Giant Mine and present a large, large target for exploration uh, that could yield million, multi million ounces deposits or multi million ounces discoveries over time. Uh, we've been focusing on the con mine. We signed a deal with Newmont in 2021. And I think one of the biggest aspects of, of the con mine exploration strategy was to fulfill and, and go along the Campbell Shear, learn about the potential of it. So we were able already to outline close to 6,000 ounces near surface, plus the 600,000 ounces that was left in the mine. And currently we're exploring south and down dip of the mine which produced 5 million ounces at the grade of 16 grams. Our first hole in 55 intersected 13 grams over 1.7 meters, showing that the Campbell shear was still present below the mine. With the infrastructure that the car mine presents and the short circuit um, where we can permit the project much faster than a greenfield environment, where we are working in a disturbed environment, but with infrastructure, for example, our infrastructure in Yellowknife include electricity, power, 20,000 people town, 
all the road, the access, a warehouse, a water treatment plant, and of course a pond, a settling pond that can be used. A lot of things that have been left by the by Newmont when the, this, this man told the mine after purchasing Miramar is of great value in case we start a mine again. Our threshold, finding one and a half million ounces or two on the, ten, on the con mine, which will allow us to have enough ounces to support developing a new mine in the Yellow Knight. The potential is huge. There's no question that the con mine comes with a big advantage. It's a brownfield project. It's got a mining lease. Not only that, Yellow Knife controlled 900 square kilometers of property, more than 50 miles of the Campbell Shear. Remember, this is the big target. This is what generated 14 million ounces over three, four miles. So you can imagine what you can find north and south of that, of those two mines that produce 14 million ounces at grade of 16 to 22 grams. It doesn't stop there. North of town, satellite deposits have been found. We have approximately 1.2 million ounces north of town that could be used as custom milling as well. And we feel that some of that is very close to surface and could yield definitely a much bigger uh, prospect for having more ounces on our book with time. Exploration has been tough on Junior, there's no question. But valuation are so low that they're not even going down anymore. Why is that? Because we're value at $10 an ounce. Imagine, you can definitely think about gold price of 2460 or 2457 in 2024 August, and you have a valuation of $10 an ounce. All in costs average $1,500 an ounce in the world. So why is there so much disparity? It's just because believe, people have maybe stopped believing that gold is a great asset. On the contrary, gold goes up because it's one of the greatest assets. I wish you would spend time on our website, look at the potential. Gold Terra is one of the most undervalued, high-grade assets in the best location in Northern Canada with infrastructures. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, getting, have more to go, and get a few more stock picks, and then some more interesting information, and then Q&A. If there are some questions and answers, or the answers come from me, I guess, but if you have any questions, just put it in the chat box. Um, okay, just gonna take a quick look at the market. Okay, good, thank you. And now we go back. Let's go slideshow. Okay. So everything depends on your risk. Obviously, when we deal with large market cap stocks, there is, in most cases, not always, um, less risk involved, uh, but accordingly less reward and the further we go down uh, the market capitalization the risks very often are increased depending on their financial situation and the reward is correspondingly raised so there of the major caps and if you're a very large billion dollar fund you're not necessarily going to invest in a 10 million dollar company unless you want to own it there are four that we like at the moment Agnew Eagles which is probably in our opinion one of the best run uh, whether you want to call it mid-cap or large-cap. Barrett Gold, which has just recently come on our list. Uh, I was very impressed when we met the president for a presentation a few months ago, and at the end, you know, he was talking about profit, 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 as opposed to, you know, gold ounces. And at the end, I sent him an email later, are you sure you're running a gold company because you're talking about profit? It sounds like a business. So they've really turned this company around. So we like it. DRD Gold, which is a good favorite of ours. It's, it's one of our only uh, South African picks, although now it's larger goes to Australia. It's a perfect, if you're an SRI investor or, or you're an activist investor, this cleans up mines uh, and 
it's, it's a win-win on, on, on a socially responsible way. So if you're very concerned about that, DRD Gold, very strongly recommend it. If, by the way, if you're in New York, you'll be presenting for us uh, in September. And of course, Wheaton Precious Metals, which is a, definitely a home run. So those are the biggies. If you want to just be somewhat using it as a defensive reason. Then as the market cap goes lower, which is the 100 to 500 mil, there are four we like as well. EMX Royalties, O3 Mining, Vox Royalty, and Step Gold, all relatively smaller companies. Um, again, they're longer term plays. Maybe they'll jump tomorrow, but we're talking about holding them for multiple years, uh, at least for a double or triple, that is to say probably more than uh, the next uh, six months. Then we have a few favorites that we like because they presented for us and we like the company. To me, management is extremely important, even as important as the finance and as the properties. Good management is important. Gold Terry, you just heard, if you only had one, I think it's worth it. It's four cents, five cents, it's the most you can lose. PT Gold, excellent management, Soma Gold as well. So these are ones you can take a look at if you want to have a higher risk tolerance. Silver, we have three that we like. If you only had one, it would be Max Silver. Uh, if you only had two, it would be Max Silver and Bazella. Bazella is interesting, by the way. They basically have an IRR potentially of 93%, which means if you give them a few billion dollars, you get it back in about 15 months or so. It's not a bad deal. And Silver One, which is a company that's presented for us. We like the management and we like their diversification. And hopefully they'll both of them hopefully will be presenters for us at our December webinar. Now, the following is for really high risk or for fun. So this is a very famous saying, he doesn't take a risk, doesn't drink champagne. Those of you that, uh, it's basically Russian um, car drivers use that. We used to treat a micro cap, that's a company that's going for a nickel or a dime, maybe a capitalization of 3 million, 5 million, 10 million as non-expiring options. You just hold it, and if it goes up a nickel or a dime, or, you, know, you, you, you know, it's supposed to a stock that goes from 18 to 1795, you can own it. But then we found out sometimes they do expire. So we realize these are not non-expiring options, they are long-dated options, where you may be holding it five, 10 years. And we've sometimes done that and made our money, but you've got to be willing to do that. On the other hand, you have to realize this is speculative capital only for the next ones. That is to say, money you can afford to lose without materially changing your lifestyle. In the old days, we used to tell people that if, if you want to invest in some of these type companies, the micro caps, imagine you say taking $200 or $500, putting it on your lawn in $100 bills and setting fire to it. And if you could handle that, go ahead. You don't sell your house uh, and because if you're wrong, you're in bread and water instead of champagne. So these are things you should look at. I think they're interesting. The ones we look at do baby investments, but maybe more. Some of them are going to be big winners. So here are five. We've mentioned uh, two of them before. Very inexpensive. Gold Terra, PT Gold, Silver Storm, Strike Gold, and Tessera. These are things we change periodically. Uh, we took one off, put another one in, and over every few months we change this. Sometimes we just take a loss of a penny or two. Sometimes we take a profit of a double. Uh, sometimes we just hold it. So these, again, very high speculative, generally speaking, very good management uh, and very good risk reward. But again, this is nothing like buying a billion dollar company. It's not like buying IBM. But here's a list for you. So our recommendations, and then we have a trade for you for the week. Maximum allocation of precious metal investments, whatever that is for you, 5%, 10%, maybe more. Regardless of gold and precious metals, you're never wrong buying a stock with strong cash flows, sound balance sheets, and growing dividends, even if you may have to hold them for five years, like Warren Buffett. And we always say an active, well-managed market portfolio outperforms index funds, but that can be a lot of work if you don't have a professional um, advisor, you better enjoy it because otherwise you may be better off taking an index fund uh, or sector funds. Okay, I'm going to repeat and then I'm going to give you something very interesting. Again, big challenges. Anyone who thinks so is wrong. 
we, accept, we advise you to take caution at this time. Uh, most important, have the ability to buy if and when markets panic. If you're fully invested, if you're a margin, I would suggest consider changing that strategy. Winners and losers, this is trader's paradise. A lot of money can be made just trading intraday, one or two days. I know people doing that. I know some people who just say they trade uh, 120 minutes, that's to two minutes once a month and make 90% and never are wrong. I have my doubts on that, about being never wrong. But anyway, if you're an investor, you need a longer investment horizon. If you're a trader, always shorter and shorter and shorter or very tight profits. Now, those of you who know some astrology, at 226 is a super blue moon. And this is very interesting because not only is the sun, is, um, excuse the astrology jargon for about two minutes, we'll translate. Not only is the sun your moon in a T-square with Uranus, which says, surprise, what you're not expecting may happen, but the Venus opposition Saturn in a tight T-square with the Mars Jupiter, which means we can have big movements. Could be up, but I don't think so. So, what we issued today, a little earlier than we would normally be doing it because of the fact we had this to do, was a volatility play. This suggests to me that by 226, since I couldn't watch it, but I think I'd be in it already, we'd want to buy volatility. Initially, we said around 1550, we were watching it, and we decided to do some trades. Uh, we did three of them. We issued a new um, Twitter. We did one a little early at 14.8, well, one at 15. That was a dash early, but that was the even level. One at 14.80. And the third one is either going to be a 226, that's not 220, uh, or MOC, that we're going to wait a little bit for the um, exact cliffs. Uh, so that's sort of in there. This is something I'm going to leave up again for you to think about before we take any questions and answers. Again, I'll repeat because we can't repeat it too much. There's a global slowdown recession coming, granted whether you like it or not now, but it may not be acknowledged for post-election. Three easy plays are gold now, cash, entertainment, selectively so, but more so as we get to next year. Both did extremely well during the depression. I'm not forecasting a depression. Markets down August, we had it, but can be again the next few days, high risk. December or actually post November uh, election. That's within 30 days of that Jupiter-Saturn. The BRICS, you better buy some volatility for that. Maybe nothing's going to happen, but I would certainly consider buying some puts for that on the U.S. dollar, etc., possibly buying some gold. The election is going to move things back and forth as one becomes more likely than the other. And again, a pair trade, which for some of your gold at 2,500 where we are, or 34 silver to sell gold and buy silver stocks, uh, to buy gold, excuse me, and then uh, silver stocks. So we've said that before, that's important. I'm gonna leave it there for a moment. Uh, we're gonna take some questions, but first I wanna look at the market. If you don't mind, I just wanna see where we are. And the market, as we can see, is up. Uh, we can see this futures around 5,600. We may do something there. And we're at 1473, so we're a little bit under on our VIX. I would have done it a little bit later, but we have uh, a buy at 1480 and 15. So a little early, but that's what happens when you're trading. One should always not be trading when you're uh, doing this sort of work. So let's see if there's any questions. There may not be. I may have answered everything you want to know. But let's take a quick look. And, um, take a quick look. Whoop. No. How do you like that? No questions. Well, then we go. Uh, very interesting. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, 
And again, consider the big picture and I welcome you all, but please be careful. Please be careful or be on a trading screen. Uh, and at certain times, such as in October 22nd, it's trader diapers. Remember that. As well as eclipse time coming up today. Tra actually, uh, super full moon. So trader's diapers this afternoon.